Hi, and uh, welcome to this um, uh, presentation of the second of the ones I'm doing this year in 2019 here in the Ashland Senior Center. Um, for those of you who haven't been here before or don't know me, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an elder law attorney. That's all I do. I work at Myrick O'Connell. There are now about 70 of us, about 40 in Worcester, 20 in Westboro, where I spend most of my time, and 10 in Boston. We're actually now the biggest law firm outside of the city of Boston that isn't like centered in the city of Boston. But because we're multi-specialty that way, everybody gets to do what they really like doing, and I like doing this. Uh, I do nothing but elder law. I have been coming here now for a lot of years. I want to say about seven or eight. Um, and what I try to do is in the spring, I do two presentations, which are more general interest, and then in the fall, two more specific ones. So the last one I did elder law for couples, and this time I did elder law for singles. I'm doing elder law for singles. If you were at the last one, there were a couple things that I'm going to repeat because there were a few things that are, have the same effect whether you're single uh, or double. Uh, but a lot of it is really uh, unique to singles because you're, you're planning options and therefore your strategies really change if you're single. So um, you know my, my friends Frank and Mary and their kids Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. You know that as we've always talked about, um, their goal is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. But now, for today, we're just talking about uh, Mary because Frank, as fortunately, has died and been buried in the backyard. And, and Mary feels that confident that Frank has gone to heaven and maybe not. And I think the bottom line is that wherever he's gone, he's no longer here and therefore cannot be part of the estate plan for Mary. So she's got to try to figure out, uh, especially if she hasn't done things, if she didn't do some things while the two of them were both alive, what she can do. She's got her kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. They're all in different situations. Some have got kids, some haven't, some are doing well, some aren't. You know, there are a bunch of questions that she needs to answer in terms of that long-term estate plan. That, well, which could be short-term, which is what happens after she dies. But in, the short, but in the short term, there are some immediate things that she needs to do. She needs to make sure that she is dealing with short-term disability. Now, everybody from any age needs to make sure they're dealing with that. But the older you get, the more likely it is that something's going to happen. And even for a short stay, you're going to end up in the hospital. And someone is going to be needing maybe to make a medical decision for you if you can't or to handle your legal affairs. Um, Mary wants to get, make sure she's got the estate plan right. Uh, especially since in this case she didn't do it before Frank had died, so she's still got some, some questions about that. And by the way, I always mention to people, so you know, you need to try to do your estate plan as if you were to die this year or within a year, because things change, because things change, because your families, your kids change, the situations change. And so the reason that you want to, you, you want to, don't, don't try to figure out when you're doing your estate plan what's definitely going to happen over the next 10 years because you have no idea, right? Uh, just try to figure it out in the short term, but try to develop a plan that is flexible enough that you can change it. Um, we want to make sure, to the extent that Mary can, that she does her estate plan so as to avoid probate, and we're going to talk about that. And finally, she wants to make sure that she's minimizing or eliminating her estate tax. The estate tax is only relevant if you have total assets of over a million dollars. And it, was, it is typically never relevant for folks around here, if you, are, if you are married, because if one of you dies, the amount that you leave to your spouse gets subtracted from your taxable estate. And while many people around here have a total estate of more than a million dollars because of the fact that real estate has gone up and people have got IRAs and 401ks, typically they don't have two million. So when one person dies, typically what they're leaving to the surviving spouse is, le is less than a million dollars. It's like half of whatever that l half of two million was. When the surviving spouse dies, though, there may be an issue. So we're going to talk about that a little bit also. We're going to assume at the beginning that Mary is 65 years old. We're going to later assume that she's a little older because some of her concerns change as she gets older. Uh, we're assuming that she has these assets, a home that's worth about $350,000, uh, savings worth two hundred fifty, dollars IRA or 401k worth three hundred, dollars uh, an annuity that has uh, the kids named as death beneficiaries for about two hundred, dollars uh, total assets $1,100,000. The two things, as soon as Mary calls and I talk to her about her estate planning, that she has to have, that I tell her, if, if, even if you don't do any estate planning, you have to have these two because it's for you. The first is your health care proxy. Raise your hand if you have a health care proxy. That's just about everybody. Raise your hand if I asked you if you could find it within 10 minutes at home. Oh, that's good. 
that's about half. That's a really important thing because if you have a, a medical emergency and they cart you off to the hospital, the healthcare proxy that's in the drawer that you couldn't find isn't going to help them, especially if, if you are not in a condition where you can tell them who your proxy is. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, proxies, you can do them anytime. You don't need a notary. Um, all you need is two witnesses. The only rule is that a witness can't be the person you're naming as a proxy. It can be your, your, your kids. It can be anybody you want. Um, it only becomes effective when a doctor has said in writing that you can't make a medical decision. It's the only time. And you can only name one agent at a time. I, uh, as I often speak to people, often they'll want, if they got kids, like in Mary's situation, maybe they want to name two kids at the same time because they want everybody to be participating. But you can't do that. The law says one at a time. The reason is simple. If I'm a doctor and you've got a medical problem and I need to talk to somebody about what to do, I don't want to hear two of your kids arguing about this, right? I want to talk to one child and know that I can rely on that person and, and know that I am covered, right? I'm not going to get sued as long as I listen to that one child, okay? Um, you can terminate your proxy at any time. So you can, and, you, and automatically, if you do a new one, you've automatically terminated your old one. Where do you keep it? Now, I asked you whether you could find it. Um, you know, kind of as a joke, but it's really an important thing. It, it, if you've got an emergency, that means you're probably going into the hospital, which means, and the hospital probably doesn't have it. Does your hospital have your health care proxy? Probably not. If you went to the hospital and got checked in and they had you sign a proxy there in case something happened while you were there, when you left, they probably threw it away. So it's probably not in your medical record. The best place to have it, um, well, first, you want to give your proxy a copy. Oh, and you want to tell your proxy that they're the proxy? Um, I've, I've talked to a re recently at a, at a local hospital, one of the discharge, or one of the, 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 the intake people, and I said, so when p somebody comes in and, and, you know, and you call, you have the proxy and you call the proxy, do any of them not know that they're the proxy? And she said, yeah, about 20%. One out of five have never been told that they're the proxy. So you really want to tell, that pro tell the person that they're the proxy. You also want to have a little bit of a conversation with them about how you want to be treated if the proxy gets kicked in. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, a little bit more a little bit later on. But the best place to have this is at your doctor's office. The healthcare proxy law in Massachusetts actually says that if you give your proxy to your doctor, he or she has to put it in your medical records required. And it's the best place for it. That way, you're on vacation, no matter where you are, they contact your doctor, the doctor can email the, uh, the, um, the proxy form to that hospital, okay? Uh, power of attorney, have to have a power of attorney. If, in, you know, in case, once again, just in case. The, so the proxy form will allow someone to make medical decisions. That's the only thing it allows them to do. And it only allows them to do that once your doctor has said that you can't make a decision. All other decisions, like admission, to a facility other than a hospital, um, calling the bank, calling your insurance company, doing anything. These are all legal decisions. No one's going to talk to anybody on your behalf without a power of attorney. So let me tell you a story. Um, th th so th I have a client right now. He, um, when I saw him first, he was at Metro West Health. He's now at Whittier. I saw him first about two and a half weeks ago. I, I've discussed th this with his sister. He, he has no kids. He has three siblings. I've discussed this with his sister. She thinks he's going to live. I think he's going to die. Um, if he lives, he's going to be in a nursing home. If he dies, he's going to be dead. But, but in either of those cases, it would be nice if they could deal with the $100,000 that's now at Bank of America um, because he doesn't own a house. And if he dies and those assets are in Bank of America and he's got no one else named on those accounts, um, those assets are going to have to go through the probate process, which is going to waste a year and cost this person several thousand dollars. If he lives, <clears throat> then these assets need to be restructured so that he can qualify for mass health if he goes to the nursing home. In either case, <clears throat> someone needs to get to that money. And there's, no health, and there's no power of attorney. So the sister called me and said, can you come to the hospital? So I went to the hospital, talked to the guy. It became clear at that time that this person, while he could, he could nod and he could shake his head, he doesn't have the ability to sign his name. So I had um, the sister, is so, and we, so I had drafted a proxy, I brought it with me. Um, 
I had the sister sign his name, naming herself as the proxy, and, and I notarized it. <clears throat> she then brought it to Bank of America. And then uh, the next day I heard from her, they said, oh, Bank of America won't take this because the signature didn't match up. It did, didn't look like his signature with their, their, on their form. So he's, they said, you know, you need, to do a, you need to do a special power of attorney that has an authorization authorizing somebody else to sign and it has two witnesses. I said, okay, fine. Um, they don't really need this. But anyway, I, I did another one. Went back to the hospital two days later. We had him sign the new, we had him authorize somebody else to sign his name on his behalf. We had two witnesses. I notarized it. I said, okay, now take this to the bank. She took the thing to the bank. A couple, next day I get a call. Bank of America, we had a long conversation with the people of the bank. They won't take it. They won't take the power of attorney. Why not? They won't tell us. They said, have your lawyer call. Okay, so I called the Bank of America branch and talked to the person they dealt with and said, so, you know, what about this power, of, what is the problem with this power of attorney? Oh, well, you have to call and talk our, to our legal department, but first you have to call customer service. And I said, oh, so, so who do I call, what do I do? She said, well, here's the general customer service number, and you just call. And I said, you mean I'm not gonna need like an account number or a social security number to call? Oh no, just call. So I called. Well, of course, I got a robo lady that answered saying, you know, to talk to us, please submit your account number or your social security number, which I didn't have. So I then went back and called my client, my, I, and called the sister and said, can I have the you know, account number and a social security number? Said, sure, she gives me that. Now I call the robo call again and I punch in the social security number. Oh, now I get a human being from California who says, oh, hello, Mr. So-and-so, right? Who was the guy who was on the account, right? And I said, I'm not him, I'm his attorney, but there's this, there was this issue regarding a power of attorney to his sister. And, and he said, oh, I can't talk to you. I don't have a power of attorney from him to you. I can't talk to you. I said, but that's what the bank told us to do, was to have me talk. I said, can you connect me with the legal department? Oh, we never connect people with the legal department. Oh, no, you know, because you don't have a power of attorney. So I said, well, th look, this is the situation, and I have a guy who may be dying, and this is a big issue. We need to deal with this. Let me put you on hold. Puts me on hold. 20 minutes comes back. There's nothing we can do for you, he says. Nothing we can do for you. Have his sister go back to the bank. I said, that's where she went which ended up with me having to do this call. To this moment, this issue has not been resolved. This guy has not died yet, right, or gone to the nursing home. We'll see. So two, two messages from this story. One, I wouldn't go to Bank of America if you paid me. The two, though, you have to have a power of attorney. This guy wasn't expecting any of this. He had a stroke. Right? You just don't know. You have to have a power of attorney. So, power of attorney. You don't need, it, you don't need witnesses unless the, your, your attorney is going to need to act on your behalf with, regarding property in another state in which there may be a requirement. There's no requirement in Massachusetts. If you've got property in New Hampshire, Florida, some other states, you need witnesses. Uh, notarization is not required unless the, you're giving your attorney the power to sign uh, and record le um, uh, deeds and other real estate documents. Uh, but it's preferred. And the reason is the person deciding whether your power of attorney is valid is not like a lawyer or a judge. It's the guy at the bank, you know, and your son is going to the bank with your power of attorney and saying, I need to withdraw some of my mother's money. And the, and the bank teller is going, oh, I don't know if this is valid, you know. So you want a document that really looks valid. And there's something about having a notary seal on it, I have found over the time, that makes it feel, seem to most people to be valid. So that's why you want it notarized. Um, on the power of attorney, you can name more than one person um, at the same time. You can name a couple of your kids jointly, so they both have to sign. You can name one or more kids jointly or severally, so that any one of them can act on your behalf, so that if one of them's not around, the other one can do it. Um, and a new one does not revoke an old one. This is really important. So a power of attorney, you can have a whole bunch of powers of attorney out to different people at the same time. And one doesn't revoke any others. So just kind of as a tip, if, if you do intend to revoke your old power of attorney because you don't like the person you named or you don't trust them, and that's why you're doing a new one, what you should also do is go to your financial institutions and tell them that you did this revocation. 
and sends, send a written revocation to the first person. The reason for that is that there's, a there's probably a provision in your, how many you have a power of attorney? Raise your hand. Oh, not, no, it's not enough. Everybody's got to have one of these. Everybody's got to have one of these. Um, it, 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 there's probably a provision in your power of attorney that says, and this is really to make the power of attorney useful, that if your attorney says to that bank teller and signs a little uh, or sworn statement saying it, that you're not dead and that the power of attorney has not been revoked, that bank teller can hand that person all your money and the bank's not li liable. And that's the reason why powers of attorney can be used. Otherwise, your son could go to the bank with the power of attorney and the bank person could say, well, how, I how do I know this hasn't been revoked? Well, how do you show them it hasn't been revoked? You can't, right? So that's why this provision is in there. But as a result, if you do revoke one, <clears throat> you want to tell those people the thing has been revoked. A um, couple of other things. If you have a power of attorney, when you go home tonight, go look at it. And see, I bet you haven't read it, right? So, and, and, and see about these things. See, if you own real estate, make sure that there's a real estate authorization that allows your attorney to sign deeds and other things on your behalf. Um, make sure that your, uh, that your power of attorney, to the extent that you think it's appropriate, uh, allows your attorney to make gifts uh, on your behalf to himself or herself or to anybody else. Otherwise, they're not. That they can't make gifts. They can only do things just for you, which doesn't mean making gifts. Um, and finally, make sure that there's no limit on the amount of those gifts. Many powers of attorney that were drafted by people who don't do a lot of elder law, but rather do a lot of estate tax related stuff, will often have a provision in there saying that no gift can be made in excess of the what's so-called the, 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 the federal gift tax limit, which is now $15,000, which is irrelevant, and I'm gonna talk about that later, but the point is it may be in there. So I have this situation right now with a lady in Lancaster who has a husband who's, who's got pretty serious dementia. She's gonna be needing to qualify him for mass health. So in order to do that, we can do that fairly quickly, but he's gonna to need to shift all of his assets to her and then she's gonna to need to do some other stuff. Except that he can't sign at this point. And she's sent me her power of attorney. And first, it specifically only authorizes gifts to her kids, not to her. Why in the world that is in there, I have no idea. Um, second, it says no gift beyond this federal gift tax limit. So in other words, she hasn't got the capacity to give anything to herself. And even if she could, the most that she could give would be, would be this $15,000, which doesn't help me in terms of trying to restructure a million dollars in assets so that I can qualify this guy for mass health. So you want to make sure, if, if to the extent that, that you've got a power of attorney, that this flexibility is in there. Um, next for Mary is getting the estate plan right. So her basic estate plan is very straightforward. She just wants to give everything to her kids. She wants to divide everything evenly among her kids. Now I want to emphasize that in that case, if these kids are from her marriage with Frank, then even though she doesn't have a will, if she dies and assets go through the probate process, at the end of the probate process, that's exactly what's going to happen. The, kid, the assets are going to get divided equally among the kids whether or not she has a will. So she's not writing a will to have that happen. She's also not writing a will to avoid probate because whether or not she has a will, uh, if she dies owning things, those assets, are whatever she owns in just her name is gonna go through the probate process. Um, so we're gonna talk about that a little bit more later. But the first question is, is that really what she wants to have happen? And the way she should decide that is by saying, yes, yeah, she wants her assets divided, but, but, do any of her kids have creditor problems? Do we, we don't want to leave things to a child only to find out that it's all going to the IRS, you know, or to some other creditor. Does any of her kids have a marriage problem? You don't want to leave something to her and only to find out that the daughter-in-law you never liked in the first place is going to get it because she's filing for divorce, right? Um, does, the, does your child have disabilities? Because if so, giving assets to your child may disqualify him for some government programs like MassHealth, for example. Finally, Grandchildren. Oftentimes, Mary will tell me, I really want to leave some stuff to my grandchildren for their education, right? And I'll tell her, you can do that, but remember that when you're making that gift, what you may be doing is actually making a gift like to Harvard. Because when your, ch your grandchild goes to fill in the FAFSA form, F-A-F-S-A, the federal form dealing with financial eligibility, which many other colleges also use, 
the, while the schools aren't required to do this, chances are they're going to subtract dollar for dollar the money that is in that child's name or in trust for that child for educational purposes from what they give them in student aid. If, on the other hand, the money had gone to the child's parent, to Mary's daughter or sons, right, there will be a different formula applied. Typically, I am told it is like five to one for all of the assets that the parent has the child is assumed to, be, to, to have a dollar, of, or, or for every five dollars the parent has, the child is assumed to have one dollar available. Each colleges have different formulas, but just remember that if you're giving the money to the grandchild, for a very good reason you're doing that, that it may be having that effect. Okay? Um, every, every family is different, that's why you want to be thinking about those issues. There are a few other issues if Mary is doing a will that she's got to be concerned about. Um, you want to make sure that there are no you're not building in any ties. You want to make sure that you're not naming a couple of your kids <clears throat> as the personal representatives used to be called the executor under the will. And therefore, if they argue, there's no way to figure it out. If they disagree regarding how much the house should sell for, for example, they have to figure it out. You always want to name a tiebreaker in those situations. As I've heard, you may have heard me say here before, I've been named, I've been named the tiebreaker. That's often my role. You never name me as the personal representative or lawyers because we cost so much, you know. You don't need the lawyer to do everything. I don't want to, you know, you don't want me cleaning out the house at $435 an hour. You know, that's stupid, right? You want me to provide legal advice. So the personal representative, the best person is someone you trust who can hire a lawyer or hire an accountant or whatever if, you, if that is really necessary, okay? Um, you you want to make sure that you're avoiding ambiguity. Um, for example, um, on the house, if you, if you, if you, what, you're, what you want to have happen is the house gets sold and the money gets divided up. You should say that in the will as opposed to saying, I'm dividing everything among my three kids. So that it's clear that the house gets sold as opposed to the three kids get the house. Because if the three kids get the house, now they all own the house. And now if they need to sell the house, everybody's got to agree. Everybody's got to sign the deed. Everybody's got to sign the purchase and sales agreement. So you may want to be kind of specific about that. If there is an issue regarding occupancy of the house, that's, uh, that's, a typical, that's one of the most common sources of family friction. Somebody, it is agreed, can stay in the house after you die, right, on some terms. Oh, as long as they pay the taxes and the insurance. Well, no, not really. You want to make sure they also, you know, make sure the heating system is still working. And if the roof falls off, how do we deal with that? So if you're going to do something like that, you want to be really specific about what the terms of the deal are. Uh, we talked about grandchildren. Uh, so once you've figured out how you want things to be divided up, the question is whether this needs to go through the probate process, and therefore, or whether you can avoid the probate process, thereby avoiding the time and expense. <clears throat> to understand why to avoid probate, you need to understand why probate's there. It's there for two reasons. One, to make sure that the correct people get what you own after you die, if it's not clear who gets it. In other words, if there isn't a bank account that's joint with somebody else or that has a named death beneficiary or a 401k or an IRA that has a death beneficiary. Typically, the, the large assets that trigger probate, the big one is the house, the smaller one is the car. Those, both of those assets, if you own them when you die, are going to trigger probate. Um, so the way probate works is whatever assets go into probate, um, th they get divided up according to either the rules of intestacy, the rules that apply when you don't have a will, and as I mentioned in this case that means the kids would each get a third, or the rules in the will. But in either case those rules don't apply until creditors have been paid because creditors have first dibs on all of your assets. And the way that you find out whether creditors have been paid is they have one year from the date of your death to file a claim in the probate court, which is the reason why it's not that the lawyer is lazy, it's the reason why probate always takes more than a year because you have to wait out that year before you can finally divide up the assets. So that's one of the reasons why people try to avoid probate is so they don't have to waste that year. Um, personal property never triggers a probate. Tangible personal property, the stuff in a house. I've been doing this now for 42 years. I've yet to see that raise an issue. Kids, the kids just divide up the stuff. Don't worry about that. Um, cars do. Cars have a title to them. So if you sell that car of yours, or somebody tries to sell it after you die, they have to have a title that shows they can do that. <clears throat> and in order to do that, if the car is still in your name, 
they have to get appointed as your personal representative by the probate court and then go to the registry and change the title, right? So the, the only easy way to avoid, well, there are a couple of ways to avoid that. One is to just, if you know who's you, whom you want to give the car to, or to whom you want to give the car, um, you just put them, their name jointly with you on that car now. And that way when you die, they become the sole owners of the car. And, now, and, if, and if your child doesn't want to be on the, car, the title with you because they think you're a terrible driver, then you have to increase your insurance. That's the way it goes, right? That's kind of the easy way to do it. Other people will, some people will actually sign the title ahead of time and just kind of leave it in storage um, and, and then tell, if they get sick, tell whoever's named as their, as their, on their power of attorney, get the car sold now or get it transferred before I die so you don't have to go through this process, right? Um, wills, as I mentioned, do not avoid probate. You're trying to avoid probate because of the legal cost. Legal cost about three to ten thousand dollars, but mostly because of that delay. And remember, when you're avoiding probate, you're not saving yourself any money. You're only saving time and expense for your kids. So if you're not worried about this, well, don't bother. But to the extent that you want to save money, then that's the way to do it. <clears throat> uh, quick test. <clears throat> there, there's Mary's assets again. She owns her house. She's got savings of $250,000 in a bank account. It's in her name. Uh, she has an IRA or a 401k worth uh, $300,000. She has an annuity with a death beneficiary, $200,000. If she dies tomorrow, will there need to be a probate? Raise your hand if you think there would need to be a probate. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you think there would not need to be a probate. Raise your hand. Ah, the eyes have it. That is correct. The house and the savings account would require a probate. <clears throat> the other assets would not have to go through probate and would be distributed right away. The house and the, and, the, and the savings account though, you need to go through the probate process, wait that year until the assets got divided up. So how do you avoid probate? The easiest way was the way that Frank and Mary did it before Frank died. They simply owned everything jointly. Because when you own something jointly, that means you each own 100% of the asset. So if one of you dies, that person's interest just evaporates, the other person becomes the sole owner. That's the easiest way. TOD or POD, on many bank accounts, as well as investment accounts, you can simply name the people who are to receive those assets when you die. And if you've done that, then those assets won't have to go through probate. You've always done that on, a, on your 401ks or your IRAs. You may want to do it on your other accounts, and you may want to check with your bank as to whether they'll let you do that. That varies by bank. Um, Trusts, probably the most, <clears throat> excuse me, the most, con I'm going to talk about trusts a little bit in a, in a few minutes. Finally, last minute giving, last minute giving, a seldom used device to avoid probate, although my friend who's, who is not doing well in Whittier, um, I've talked to them about that. So if you simply give away everything before you die, specifically these assets that were going to go through probate, well then there's no probate at your death. And so what you may want to do, if you've named an attorney your, through your power of attorney whom you trust, probably one of your kids, is you may want to tell them, if I'm, you know, you, I don't want to distribute all my assets now, I don't want to have no assets, right? But if I'm sick and it looks like I'm going to die, just distribute everything. Just distribute everything. Um, now, there, in, in the case of the house, I would suggest, that for reasons I'll talk about in a few minutes, that actually what that person does is distributes to the other kids a so-called remainder interest in the house and keep a life estate. But the point is, you're, with your power of attorney, your agent could do all of that and could just give everything away. Now, but you come, you'd say to yourself, you'd say to me, but no, I can't do that because something bad happens if I give away a lot of money. How much is that? What's the magic? I bet, I bet you have in the back of your mind, if I give away more than blank, Something bad happens. Anybody? $15,000. That's right. Nothing bad happens if you do that, but I'm going to talk about that some more. Right? So nothing bad happens if you just give the stuff away. Finally, uh, there's a trust. If Mary is concerned, she doesn't want us, for example, put her kids' names on the house with her as the joint tenant uh, because she's concerned one of them might get sued. Right? Or she doesn't want to have the kids with her as a joint tenant on the bank accounts because if they have some kind of a problem, right, the kids could take the money or the bank could, or, or some creditor could attach the money. In that case, if she wants to keep complete control while she's alive, while avoiding probate when she dies, she will take those assets that would be subject to probate and put them in a trust, a revocable and amendable trust. 
she'd be the trustee. So she'd have total control. She could take the assets out of trust at any time. That's what, mean, that's what revocable means. You can pull the assets out. She could amend the rules of the trust at any time. But, and she would say in the trust that when she dies, somebody else, one of her kids probably, is going to get named as the successor trustee. And that trustee would have the ability to take all the trust assets the day after she dies and distribute them. And she'd have all the rules of distribution right in the trust. And the trust would become irrevocable because she couldn't take them back the moment she dies. Right? So by doing that, she'll get instant um, distributions. She can name the creditors. There is no bad tax implication to any of this because for tax purposes, these assets that are in trust are considered to still be hers. They're so-called grantor taxable trust. So for example, if she owns the house this way, when she dies, the so-called tax basis of the property still jumps to the date of death value. Um, finally, this, this also provides for creditor avoidance. Remember I mentioned one of the disadvantages of assets going through, going through probate is they're subject to the claims of your creditors. I have a couple that actually lives in Nantucket now that, that um, had lived in Boston and raised their kids. I think there were seven kids. Um, and now the kids were all grown up. And the parents, had, they had bought a small house in Nantucket back in the late 80s for like $100,000. But it being Nantucket, it's now worth a million six, right? Little house, no water view, just happens to be in Nantucket. So, so they're concerned, though, because when the kids were going through college, they co-signed for a lot of these kids' loans. And, you know, some came doctors and lawyers and some didn't, you know. And so some kids were able to pay all their loans back and some weren't. And so they, they're still actually paying. They pay a monthly payment to one of these the student loan companies on the remaining $200,000 in student loans from kind of th this one and that one. But they're concerned that when they die, that means that the, all the money is going to get paid out of the house. So I told them, I said, well, all you do is you create a revocable and amendable trust to make yourselves the trustees of the house and specify that when you die, one of the kids steps in as the successor trustee. And then when the two of you die, all the creditors get wiped out because the creditor claims are only good against the probate estate. So it wouldn't be good against the house. Um, estate tax minimization. Uh, there are Mary's assets and they add up to $1,100,000. And uh, if she died tomorrow, it, when, she died, when, her, when Frank died, there was no estate tax because all of his assets went to her and therefore got subtracted by the taxable, by, from the taxable estate. If she dies with an estate of $1,100,000, there will be an estate tax in Massachusetts if she has that taxable estate. Now, <clears throat> to understand how to avoid that, you need to understand how the estate tax works. So the estate tax in Massachusetts was created, if I recall, around the 1920s. And it was the idea behind the estate tax is very simple. And, it, and it's that it just seemed fair or it seemed unfair that if somebody dies, their kids get all these assets tax free. While in the meantime, the government is all being paid for by everybody like us is paying income into it and buying, you know, and you pay the sales tax and stuff. So it just seemed like a windfall, especially for the children of the rich. And so the, the government, the, the state government, it was about the same time the, the, that, the, that the federal government did it. The state government um, said, OK, we're going to impose an estate tax on everybody who is rich. And, the, and the, the way we're going to impose that is, first, we're going to define rich. So rich was anybody with a taxable, with an estate of more than $40,000, $40,000, um, <clears throat> which seemed like a very little amount of money when I looked at that until I remembered when my folks who, who um, we were raised on French Hill in Marlboro, bought their two-family house in Marlboro in 1940 for $2,000, for which they needed a mortgage and a tenant to help pay the mortgage, right? Because it was $2,000. So what is 40,000? It's 20 times $2,000, right? So that house recently sold in Marlboro for $300,000. What's 20 times $300,000? $6 million, right? So just to give you a sense of what was considered to be rich then. So, so, the, so the, the, the estate tax was imposed above $40,000 in, in these little tranches. This is a graduated estate tax system. So on the money between forty dollars and $90,000, the estate would pay eight-tenths of 1%. Between the money between ninety dollars and $140,000, the estate would pay 1.6%, et cetera. And if you look down to the bottom, 
if there were a tax, if there were a taxable estate of a million dollars, the estate tax would be thirty-six thousand five hundred sixty dollars. And I mention that because in the back of your mind you're saying, but wait a minute, there's something about if I've got less than a million dollars, there's no estate tax. If the estate were a million one, which is Mary's estate, right? Mary's taxable estate. The estate tax is forty-two thousand six hundred forty dollars. Now, the reason why I show you this chart is not because of just the history, but because it's still in effect. This is the Massachusetts estate tax chart, which has never been changed. The only thing that has been changed, and this happened over time, is the minimum subject to taxation. Because as it happens back by about the 1950s, it was happening that everybody that died with a house was paying an estate tax because the real estate values had gone up so much. right? And so people leaned on the legislature, and in response, the legislature said, oh, what we'll do, instead of changing the chart, because that would be really complicated, we'll just change the minimum amount subject to taxation. We'll raise it from 40000 to 100000 <clears throat> And then later it got increased, <clears throat> excuse me, to 500000 then to six, <clears throat> excuse me, and then finally to a million dollars. About 20 years ago it got moved to a million dollars, and it hasn't changed from a million dollars since then. So that leads to the question, you don't pay any estate tax if your estate is less than a million dollars. That leads to the question, what happens if you're a dollar over? What if you have a million and one dollars? Well, then what happens? Well, in some states, uh, and I know I use the example of Rhode Island. Rhode Island was like this until about three years ago. Their estate tax was ruefully referred to as a cliff tax because if you kept it below their magic number, which was $650,000, because they had done the same thing. They had a chart which you know, really taxed low, and then they did these increases. If your, your estate was worth less than six fifty, you paid no estate tax. If you were a dollar over, though, you fell off the cliff, and you owed all the money that you would have owed according to this chart that they had. Right? So in Massachusetts, they didn't do quite that. But they did make that exemption that you get if your estate is small disappear. And the way they did that is they said, OK, whatever your estate is, if it's less than a million dollars, there's no estate tax. If it's higher than that, you have to compute your estate tax two different ways. First, do the chart. Figure out what the number would be according to the chart. Second, take all the dollars over a million in the estate and tax them at 40%. 4-0. right? So if you're Mary, in this case, and you have an estate of a million one hundred thousand dollars, according to the chart, you would have owed $42,640. According to the alternate tax, you would have owed 10% of that extra $100,000, the money over a million, or, uh, 40, or excuse me, 10%. You would have owed 40% of the dollars over, over a million, which would be $40,000. Take the lowest number. $40,000 is a little bit lower than that $42,000 figure, and so Mary's estate tax would be 40%, right? So she does save in this way versus the chart. But when you think about it a different way, that's a tremendous tax on that last forty thousand, on that last hundred thousand dollars, right? On the hundred thousand over a million, she's paying a tax rate of forty percent. So she'd like to get rid of that, right? Now there was an easy way to do it when Frank was still alive, but now he's dead, so that's off the table. So the question is, what does Mary do in this case? Well, one possibility is to give some of it away, just to give some of it away. Now. As I mentioned to you, um, there is, there is, you all think that there's this problem with giving stuff away. Um, but so let me talk about why you think that. First, there is no Massachusetts gift tax, right? And so that's not the problem. And the receipt of a gift by your children or anyone else for that matter is not income. So it isn't like when you give them something, they're going to pay an income tax on it. So that's not the problem. The problem is the federal system. Federally, as opposed to for Massachusetts purposes, they tried to plug this gifting loophole. And so they said, okay, if you owe us more than a particular amount um, if, when you die, if your estate is higher than that amount, you pay an estate tax. And their estate tax kicks in at a very high rate. It kicks, it kicks in at over 30% on the dollars, over that magic amount. Um, and it, but in order to make sure that you don't just give everything away before you die, we're also going to have a gift tax. And we're going to say if you give away all of this stuff, we're going to tax you on those gifts. Except, except, there are two exclusions 
from the amount that you can give away before you die. There's one that you all know about. There's another one that you probably none of you know about, the first, unless you've been to one of my presentations. The first is you get to give every person every year up to $15,000. You all know that one. It used to be $10,000. It's gradually gone up with inflation. You may have thought it was still smaller, <clears throat> but that's the number. Second, in addition to that, in addition to those gifts, you can give another amount which is equal to the federal estate tax exclusion. The federal estate tax exclusion right now is $11.4 million. You have the ability, in addition to your $15,000 per person per year, to give it another $11.4 million to anybody you want tax-free. In other words, this is all irrelevant to you. There is no gift tax. There is no limit on the amount that you can give your kids or anybody else. You can just kind of give it to them, okay? So, suppose that I'm Mary. Um, there is only one place where that $15,000 per year is relevant. And the reason why I used Mary's estate at a million one was so I can show you that one place. If Mary's estate, for example, were a million three hundred thousand dollars, and she wanted to reduce her estate tax. Well, if she gave all million three hundred thousand dollars away before she died, her estate tax would be zero, because her estate would be zero. If she wanted to just reduce it by a little, though, she could give away, say, her, her, say she gave away a hundred thousand dollars. Say her estate was a million three and she gave away a hundred thousand dollars. Well, at a million three, her, t her estate tax would have been fifty five thousand four forty. If she gives away a hundred dollars, which doesn't cost her anything to give it away, her estate is now down to a million two. Her estate tax is now down to $49,040 and she saves $6,400. The reason for that is the rate, the estate tax rate on that money was 6.4%. So she saves 6.4% of that $100,000. But suppose she says, well, my estate is a million, right? And I'd like to reduce my estate but I'd like to reduce it not just by the tax on, on that $100,000. I'd like to eliminate it all because I'd like to get under that million dollar exemption number, right? So to do that though, she cannot simply give away uh, $100,000. Uh, if, if she does that, if she gives away $100,000, I think this is the, uh, yes. If she gives away, say, $115,000 and dies the next day, um, and then, then as far as Massachusetts estate tax is concerned, she will have an estate of $985,000. She'll only pay an estate tax, based on the chart, on that $985,000. But they will not allow her to compute her tax using the alternative with the minimum of a million. Because for purposes of doing that, they're going to add back in the extra 100000 of the $115,000 that she gave away at the last minute. So that's not going to solve her problem. The only way she can solve her problem is by taking that extra $100,000 and the day before she dies, giving it away in $15,000 increments. So she tells her person who is her power of attorney, look, I, we're, we're, you're going to give away $15,000 a person to seven people. Seven times 15 is $105,000. And if you do it the day before I die, and the seven people can be Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., can be the grandchildren, can be her lawyer, they, that never happens. But it can be anybody that they want. As long as she gives it away in $15,000 increments, the day before she dies, there is no estate tax. She's eliminated the estate tax because she's brought her taxable estate below a million dollars. I'm sorry that that's a little complicated, but I wanted you to see, there's, with that one exception, giving away works just great. If she gave away everything, if she gave away a million one the day before she died, there would be no estate tax. Um, all, finally, gifts to charity are always subtracted from the taxable estate. So we've had people that have literally said in their wills or in their trusts, give away everything above a million dollars to charity or to a church and, and, and give the rest to my kids or whatever. And especially in this kind of situation, right? What Mary is really giving away is, on that extra hundred thousand dollars is really only sixty cents on the dollar because the other forty she was going to pay to the government anyway right so basically it's as if she's giving away sixty thousand dollars and she's she's making the, the the department of revenue give her a forty thousand dollar match 
right? Because they're, they're not getting the money that is now going to charity. Because, so that money just, uh, given to charity just simply gets subtracted right off the top. Um, who's making the gifts? We talked about that a little bit. Finally, uh, what about if Mary is 80 years old at this point and not 65? In that case, she's got all the old considerations that we just talked about, but she's got a new one. Um, she's got those same assets, a million one, but she says, oh my God, oh, I'm not going to talk about that because I'm a little short on time. Oh my God, what happens if I need nursing home care? Now I've got a problem, right? If I go to the nursing home, the nursing home, the private pay rate's about, going to be about $14,000 a month. My income, remember from one of the earlier slides, her income from Social Security is $2,000 a month. So if I go to the nursing home, um, the nursing home is $14,000, my regular income is $2,000, which means my burn rate, the rate at which I'm going to have to spend the rest of my money, is about $12,000 per month, or about $144,000 a year. Those are big numbers. Um, and I'm going to burn that money away until I can qualify for Mass Health. Because as soon as I've qualified for Mass Health, from then on in, my $2,000 a month is going to go to the nursing home and Mass Health is going to pay all the rest. So the question is, how can I do that? And the answer, by the way, is that Mary can always qualify for Mass Health. She can always qualify for Mass Health. So even though she hasn't done any of the planning that I'm going to talk to you about, she can still qualify for Mass Health. And she'd want to do that. This is the reason. Uh, she can qualify because under Mass Health rules, this is Mass Health 101, she can, she can keep her house and qualify because the house, uh, as long as she says she intends to return home, is not a countable asset. Um, she, she has to have, show she has money of less than $2,000. Once she's done that, as I mentioned to you, her monthly income, which is the $2,000 a month, will go to the nursing home. So what does she do with the rest of her cash? She actually has, the, you know, there's her money. She's got the house. She's got another $750,000 in savings, IRA, and annuity. What she can do is she can keep the house. She can buy an annuity with the rest of the money. Um, uh, and, and she can buy an annuity of up to any amount, but I'm going to show you the amount that she should buy. She can take all the rest of the money and put it into something called a D4C pooled trust. We've talked about these before. If you want to learn more about them, Google pooled trust. Those words, pooled trust. She can transfer the money into that pooled trust. The day after she does, she's going to be able to qualify for MassHealth. Now, at the end of the day, after she dies, MassHealth is going to have a lien on her house, on the money that she transferred into the pool trust and on any remaining annuity payments to get repaid for whatever Mass Health paid on her behalf. So why in the world would she do any of that? Well, the reason is once she's on Mass Health, the rate for that bed, that nursing home bed in that same nursing home that was about $14,000 a month on private pay is only about $7,000 a month. $7,000 a month. So the way MassHealth works is her income would go to the nursing home. MassHealth will pay the difference between that number and whatever the MassHealth rate is for that bed, which we're assuming is $7,000. So MassHealth in that situation would pay $5,000 a month because the other $2,000 would be coming from her Social Security. But then MassHealth would have a lien after she died for that $5,000. And only that $5,000, the amount they actually paid. So what if before Mary were qualifying for Mass Health, she took some of her money and she bought an annuity with that money. The kind of annuity that she has to buy is an annuity that calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than her life expectancy. If she's 80, Mary's actuarial life expectancy is a little over 10 years. So say that she bought that annuity and paid, and, and she wanted payments from that annuity to pay her $5,000 a month or $60,000 a year. So as a result of buying that annuity, and then she's going to take any of the rest of her money and put it into that D4C pool trust. Now by buying that annuity, she's going to know that once she's on Mass Health, her Social Security is going to pay the nursing home $2,000 a month, and her annuity is going to pay the nursing home $5,000 a month. So the nursing home is going to be getting $7,000 a month. And even, and, but she's on Mass Health, so the bed rate for that bed is only $7,000 a month which means MassHealth won't pay anything every month, which means there'll be no lien. There'll be no lien. When she dies, all the, all the remaining assets will be safe. So that's important for Mary to know. Now, 
As a result of this, though, while Mary was in the nursing home, she was paying something. She wasn't paying that big burn rate of $12,000 a month, but she was, it ended up paying $5,000 a month, the amount that, she, that the annuity was paying, right, which she otherwise wouldn't have had to buy. If she wants to avoid that, there's only one way to do it. She has to give everything away. No. She has to give away whatever she doesn't want to have, um, have um, be leaned by mass health. So it doesn't have to be everything, but everything that she wants to have protected. So the first question is, is there someone that she trusts that she can give things to? Because her intention at that point at age 80 isn't to really give everything away, because she might need some of that, because she's living on $2,000 a month, right? So is there someone that she trusts? One of her kids, right? A trust for the benefit of her kids? Is there someone she trusts? If there isn't, then she can't do that, right? If there is, she could just give these assets away. Now, in the case of the house, in the case of the house, my, our, our recommendation to her would be, don't give away the entire house. Give away something called a remainder interest in the house. A remainder interest is the ownership of the house that kicks in the moment you die. In this, it, what, what Mary would be doing if she gave away a remainder interest is she would be keeping a life estate in the house. That is, ownership of the house until the moment of her death. If she structures things that way, five years after she's made that gift, that remainder interest is no longer countable or leanable as, ma as far as mass health is concerned. Similarly with her money. If she just gives her money away to one of her kids, five years after she's given that money away, that money is no longer countable or leanable if she needs to qualify for mass health. The, one of the other reasons of doing that with the, with the house, though, is that for mass health purposes, that remainder interest is protected. For tax purposes, however, she still owns that house, and at the moment of her death, the so-called tax basis of that house will jump to the date of death value. So when the kids sell it, they'll be able to sell it capital gains tax-free. So she can just give things away and wait five years. And it, regarding the house, she'd give away a remainder and keep the life estate. Uh, and, and by the way, another plus of doing that as far as the house is concerned goes back to the probate discussion. If she gives away a remainder interest and keeps a life estate, the moment of her death, her life estate evaporates, which means there's no probate regarding her house. Her kids own the house immediately. Um, she gets that step up in capital gains. She gets that five year, the, the, you know, after the five year look back, the remainder interest in the house is safe. The minuses, the minuses of just giving away the remainder interest to the kids or of giving the other assets to the kids are maybe they won't give them back to you, right? Maybe you've got some or one child that you really trust would do it, but oh, you're kind of worried about the others. Or you're worried that somebody, you know, kind of might get a swelled head, you know, if they have all this control of all of these assets. That is the only case where you consider doing an irrevocable trust. Everybody has heard of these, and that's why I'm not spending a lot of time on it. You always have the ability, as the alternative to giving things to the kids directly, to creating an irrevocable trust. Irrevocable in that you can't take it back and giving the assets to one or more of the kids as the trustee of that irrevocable trust. You would give the assets to your most trusted child, the one that you feel confident that if you needed it, they'd give it back to you, right? And the way they'd give it back to you, the way they'd have to give it back to you is you can't be named as a beneficiary of this trust. You can't have the right to get these assets back. So the kids would be the beneficiaries. You'd specify that your trusted child while you're alive, could make a distribution to, any, to, her, to himself or herself or to, or to any of the kids, assuming that they'll do that so that that child will turn around and give that money back to you or use that money on your behalf, right? If you're just married and you're single at this point, that's your only option if you want to protect any of these assets. Um, anybody can be the trustee. Sometimes folks will specifically say they don't want the trustee to be a person who is ultimately going to be a beneficiary. So they would name their kids as the beneficiaries and, for example, name a brother or a sister or a niece or a nephew, a trusted person, as the trustee, knowing that that trustee has no stake in the game and therefore no special reason to not be wanting to get assets distributed back to you. Um, that you need to make sure, in the, you want to be careful on these trusts. You want an elder law attorney to really look at this because you want to make sure that it's going to meet the mass health standards in terms of, in terms of there never, not being any way that you, as the, as the person giving the money, can have control over it in order to get it back. 
Uh, we already talked about all of that. Uh, if you've got any questions on this, as many of you know, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel, uh, Elder Law Frank and Mary. You can watch it there. Or thank you very much to Ashland Cable for rebroadcasting these shows, which I really appreciate, which they've been doing now for, for many years. Any questions on any of this? I know we covered a lot of stuff. If not, thank you very much, and we'll see you in the fall. Enjoy the summer. Thank you.